My name is Jillian Colino. I'm an environmental engineering major. For anyone that walked in that missed the original introduction, I'm also an intern. Um, so, we dive into my presentation. The title is Methane Potential of Indigenous Algae. So, what is microalgae? Let me give you some background. It is a unicellular plant species that's typically aquatic. It has a large biodiversity, so that means there are many different species with many different traits. So they are adapted to many different types of environments. And what's unique about microalgae is that it has a very high photosynthetic efficiency, and especially when compared to other plants. So as you can see here, um, when it comes to producing one ton of biomass, microalgae will intake almost or over double the amount of CO2 in comparison to trees. So what that really means is, um, playing off of Josh's presentation, we're taking in more CO2 and mitigating more CO2 from the atmosphere at a faster rate using microalgae. All right, so I talked about the high um, efficient photosynthetic mechanism. Another really beneficial use of microalgae is the fact that it has an elevated biomass production, so it grows very quickly and in very large proportions and quantities. So that makes it all the more beneficial to harvest. And it, as the cherry on top, it can be grown in a variety of different environments. It doesn't require arable land, so it really um, makes the spaces in which we can grow this microalgae almost wherever there's land, we can put it in. And it doesn't have to be clean water either. We talked a little bit about how we can grow algae off of landfill leachate or wastewater, and really it thrives in a variety of environments because of that high biodiversity. So what can we do with this microalgae? We can grow it, we know we can, and um, we can make a variety of different uh, products, such as pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, cosmetics, and really the main uh, product that I'm focusing on is biofuels. So here at UF, we are cultivating algae. Big surprise, I'm sure. <laughs> we have four raceway ponds, as we saw out in the back. And what we have is an open raceway pond grown off of 100% CO2. Erica described this briefly. We have the paddle wheels on the raceway ponds that help to continuously mix the algae to make sure that we are really on that peak efficiency for creating as much biomass and exposing um, a large amount of biomass to the sun and just photosynthesizing. And these four ponds, as was also previously mentioned, is indigenous algae. It comes from um, around different local areas, and its constituents or components come from a polyculture. So there's many different types of species present in our ponds, and it's a predominantly microalgae um, species. And what's different from Josh and I, because we have very similar projects, but mine is grown on 100% CO2, and it is in Gainesville off of of the polyculture and microalgae. Um, so now that we have all of this algal biomass, we need to harvest it. So the way in which we did that is we used a method called floating on ponds two and three, and I'll explain why in a minute. And what exactly floating is, is we have these carboys, these glass jugs, and we filled them up with the pond water. And because of the photosynthesis of the algae, the O2 that is um, being produced will actually cause the microalgae to rise to the surface and we're able to skim off a more concentrated biomass. And what that means is less centrifuging and um, less energy intensive and less time intensive as well because it takes a long time to centrifuge. However, for ponds one through one and four, we found that they didn't flocculate as well and this method wouldn't work. So instead of using this floating method, because we weren't seeing that production and that flocculation, we solely centrifuge. So now we have this biomass. We are processing it through anaerobic digestion. And why anaerobic digestion? Well, it has a very low energy input and you can use wet biomass. So it doesn't require any type of extensive drying like other biofuels. Um, for example, like biodiesel, you need to dry the algae first. You don't need to do that with anaerobic digestion. And there are a couple different um, main characteristics of algae that really will impact the methane production. And that is the species of the algae and the composition of the cell wall. And the species of the algae will impact the lipids, proteins, and carbohydrate content. 
And as Blaze really touched on, those are the three main um, constituents that impact methane production, um, with lipids being the easiest to digest and carbohydrates being the most difficult. And also with this species of microalgae, you have a different composition of the cell wall. And really the cell wall is a barrier for the microorganisms. Um, so it blocks the microorganisms from being able to get into the proteins and the components and the constituents that would really be able to produce the methane. So if it, a um, species of microalgae simply has a protein-based cell wall, it'll be very easy for the microorganisms to be able to um, digest that organic matter. However, if you have a hemicellular cell wall, something that's um, made mostly of carbohydrates, it's going to be more difficult for the microorganisms to be able to break or um, degrade that organic matter, and you will most likely have a lower methane yield. So for my methods, I am looking at identifying the species of algae that we currently have in our four UF ponds, and I'm doing that through microscopy and also agar isolation. And I explained that a little bit in the algae lab um, with agar isolation, I was simply streaking plates in order to get isolated colonies to grow. That way I can more um, clearly define what exactly is present in the ponds. And I also characterized the algae species present in each of the ponds through COD, TS, and VS. So the other big constituent of my project is the methane index potential, the MIP assay. And it's exactly how the other two presentations went. But um, so I had 200 milliliters of flushed dairy manure as my inoculum, and it was in uh, triplicate bottles. And I added a two grams of COD per liter of a loading. So that's how much algal biomass I added into each of my bottles. And I kept those bottles at 35 degrees C, which is in mesophilic conditions. And when it came time to actually harvest the biogas, I used a KOH barrier solution and as described earlier, the um, methane is really the only gas that's being uh, measured because the CO2 will react with the KOH, and that way the displacement is really only that of the methane gas. So my results. Immediately when looking at my um, volta solids and COD, I noticed that pond 2 had a very high volta solids, organic matter content, and COD, which as we know, that um, means more organic matter, more potential for methane production. So moving forward, we would almost expect that the methane yields of these ponds would be fairly well. So now we're going to look into each of the four ponds, and I'm going to give you an overview. So the way in which um, I did my microscopy is I identified the species, um, the species that I could, but really I focus on the genus, so I have my column for genus, and I also have a concentration because I simply didn't want to leave a list of genus just because I feel like that wouldn't be as representative. We have varying concentrations, but of course each drop that I take from the ponds is going to be different. There's going to be a lot of different varying factors. Um, so the type of composition I use was, here's my key, I counted the number of cells of a particular um, species or genus per two microliters. So um, if it was more, if I saw more than 10 um, individual cells, I would give it a plus plus rating. So you can see that here. And really, I just wanted to give a more full picture of what was inside the pond. So here you can see that Schroederia, Senegasmus, and Clostriopsis is the three main players. And the way I have these um, table setup is this top um, genus that will definitely be the main species or genus found in the ponds. So Shardaria was the biggest player and that's this picture here along with Sunny Desmus. So now moving along to pond two, we also have that Sunny Desmus in very high concentrations. However, um, below that we have this F here stands for filamentous. I found filamentous algae in our ponds. And the way I was able to identify and confirm that is I used um, UV light to show that this wasn't simply debris. There is actual chlorophyll. That's what that red line is. And um, from there, I was able to identify it as uh, leptolithia. Not particularly sure if that's the correct pronunciation, but this 
presence of filamentous algae wasn't nearly as concentrated as the sunny desmas, however, it was still very prevalent within the ponds. So now with pond two, once again, sunny desmas is a big player. It's very common in our ponds. And we also have chlorella present. That's another um, very common species. So we have two different genus of sunny des two different species of sunny desmas and chlorella. Those are our main players. And as you can see at the bottom, we have that filamentous algae again. And it wasn't nearly as concentrated as in pond two, but it was still present. You can see that in this picture. This is a general overview of what the pond looked like. There wasn't a lot of that filamentous algae, but it was still prevalent. And then here's also a picture of Cymbella, just to give you some ideas of the different types of algae, to give you more of an overview so you don't see sunny desmus every single slide, because there's a lot of sunny desmus. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my last pond, and really I didn't see any background species. It was pretty consistent, and it was chlorella and sunny desmus. And so here's a picture of the chlorella and then this different type of sunny desmus. And what's interesting about this pond in particular is when you talk about hemicellulose cell walls or when you read literature about microalgae, you hear about sunny desmus and chlorella having this really rigid cell wall and that it's very difficult to break through that. These are the uh, species that you would expect to have that carbohydrate hemicellulose wall, which we found that this was actually the pond that had the lowest methane yield. So it makes sense that we had those types of findings because of that cell wall composition. And also going back to the filamentous findings in ponds two and three, those were our two main players, especially with pond two being ahead of the pack. And it had a higher concentration of that filamentous algae, while um, pond three was right behind it with a little bit lower concentration and pond one didn't have any of that uh, filamentous algae present. However, it did have some of that um, background species. It had more biodiversity than just sunny desmus and chlorella, than just that hemicellulose. What does that mean? I was able to find that the species, species of microalgae present and the composition of a polyculture really can impact the harvesting of the ponds. Because as I mentioned earlier, ponds two and three, they were the easiest to harvest. I was able to use that floating method and they were able to flocculate much easier. And I think it's a um, logical connection to make that with the minute amount of filamentous algae present in the samples. And then also the methane yields were also higher for those samples and we saw a decrease of methane production for the ponds that only had semidesmus and chlorella with pond four. And finally, when using indigenous algae, it's clear we have a very large biodiversity that's going to give us a wide range of characteristics. The literature really focuses on pure cultures, and I think that as we continue to develop and to move towards microalgae, we'll be looking more into polycultures, and this will help aid in that. <laughs>